Well, hey everyone, and welcome to Central at Home. No matter where you are watching from or how you are watching, it's such an honor that you've decided to spend the next 45 minutes or so with us today. Now, if you're being impacted by these experiences, why don't you take a moment right now and share this on whatever platform you're watching. Our heartbeat is to see as many people as possible impacted with this life-transforming message. And this is one of the easiest and most effective ways to reach new people and spread the word about this amazing community of faith. As a church, we have a deep conviction towards connection and how important it is to our faith, connection with God and connection with each other. And as a church, we're here to help you do just that. First off, today I want to encourage you to personally connect with God. Open your heart to feel God's presence as we worship together. Open your mind to challenge your thoughts through the teaching and discussion questions after the experience and open your soul to connect with God. Also, if you'd like to worship through your giving and make sure that no one misses out on being a part of this amazing faith community here at Central, the easiest way to do this is to head over to our website, centralcc.ca slash give, and you can follow the prompts. You can schedule a one-time gift or set up regular ongoing giving. Either way, everything we do happens because of your generosity, and we just want to say thank you in advance for your generosity. One more thing we love here at Central is baptisms. Baptisms are an external sign of an internal decision to follow Jesus with your whole heart. So, if you would like to take your next step in following Jesus and be baptized, you can do that on July 11th in one of our experiences. For more information, head over to our website, centralcc.ca slash baptism, and all the information you need will be listed there. Also, we want to help you connect with others, and there are a few opportunities you can take advantage of to do just that. First off, we have groups. We have groups for all ages, demographics, and interests available for you. I want to mention a few of them to you right now. If you are watching during our broadcast times of 9 or 10.30 a.m., we'd love for you to stick around after this experience for a group called Virtual Coffee Connections. You can jump into our Zoom discussion for about 45 minutes where we engage with the message and spend some time praying together and growing in our spiritual journeys. Lastly, today, we'd love if you could join us on Sundays for our in-person experience at 9, 10.30 or 12. You do need to pre-register in advance for those experiences and the information is on the screen on how you can get connected. If you have any questions or would like to find out more of how to get connected, head over to our website, centralcc.ca slash connect or text the word central to 905-937-5610. So that's all from me. The moment you're waiting for is finally here. Our experience is about to begin, and it all starts right now. Today, we take a moment to recognize our great nation that is Canada. We recognize that today isn't a simple celebration, and for some, it's a day of mourning as we remember the cost of what brought us to this point in history. For some of us, we remember wars that were fought for our freedom, and as a result, we're incredibly grateful for the price that was paid. Others of us, it's a reminder of our family's history of immigrating to this great nation and for the opportunities that came as a result of that. And still others of us, we find ourselves saddened and angry and mourning as we continue to uncover the atrocities done in the name of Canada, the church, and even God. So today, while our culture pushes to polarize one another to cancel culture or towards ignorance, I'd like to invite you into something different. Wherever you find yourself today as you think about our great nation, I wanna invite you to use today as an opportunity to think about where you fit in the story of Canada. To ask yourself, what part do I play in the future of this nation? Am I building something that's better and beautiful or even beneficial to those around me? Or am I tearing it down? Today's an invitation to us as Christ followers to a commitment to being better. For me, this means acknowledging our own history and our own mistakes, that while we might not be part of those atrocities personally, we are connected corporately, and that's worth acknowledging. And yet it's also a commitment to letting love win in us, the kind of love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and a genuine faith where love would win not only in our lives, but in the lives of those around us. 
But this will only happen if we're willing to be honest, to seek truth, to let love be our motivation, and commit together to following in the way of Jesus, for this is what truly makes us great. This is what makes us better. And this is how we move forward. So my prayer for you today is that you take a moment to recognize our great nation, that God would keep our land glorious and free, but that will only happen as we humble ourselves, we acknowledge our shortcomings and our need for God, and we let love be our motivation. Happy Canada Day.
Oh God, it's good to be in your presence, that focus time with you so that we can hear, we can find what we're looking for, God. God, you have all the answers. And Lord, we're searching for truth, God. So Jesus, show us the way as we put you first, as we focus on your word.
Wasn't that a great song about exalting the Lord? One of the ways that we do that is by talking to him in prayer. And so at this time, I'm gonna invite you to join me. Let's pray for the nation of Canada and pray that God will continue to bless and to lead us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great and beautiful land that's called Canada, the land that we call home. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to keep this land glorious and free. We thank you, Lord, for the freedoms that we do enjoy. We thank you for the freedom of expression. We thank you for the freedom of religion. We thank you, Lord, for freedom of religious expression. Because, Lord, we know from your word that a nation that exalts you will be exalted. And so, Lord, we pray that your name will be exalted in our land. Hallowed be your name. May you be lifted up on high. May you be given the reverence that is due unto your name. We also know, Lord, that righteousness exalts a nation because righteousness will make a nation great. So, Lord, we pray that you would bring righteousness to our land. We agree with your word that says, the nation is blessed that has the Lord as their God. And your word also declares that you will give guidance to the nations that seek you and the nations that lack guidance will fall. So Lord, we acknowledge today that without your blessing, without your guidance, without your direction, we too will falter and ultimately fail. So Lord, we do pray for our leaders, for those that you have put in positions of authority. We thank you for them, but we pray for them today. Lord, we pray for our political leaders, whether it's at the national level, provincial level, or local level. We also pray, Lord, for our frontline workers, the police, the firemen, the hospital workers, the ambulance drivers. We pray, Lord, that you would protect them and keep them and we pray that you would bless them, Lord. We thank you for them. We also pray, Lord, for those that lead our nation in matters of faith. We pray that you'd keep us all true and keep us all on the right path. Please keep our land glorious and free. And Father God, we pray for all of the nations, all of the races, all of the ethnic groups, that you have gathered into this nation. We love them and we pray for them today. We pray, Lord, that you would bless us with unity and with harmony and with love. And Lord, would you please forgive us for the times that we have not expressed your love the way we should have. Your word tells us, Lord, that when you hold back the rain or when you send pestilence to a land, that if we will just humble ourselves, put aside our pride and call upon your name, if we will repent of our sins and turn from our evil ways, then you will hear our prayers and you will forgive us our sins and you will heal our land and you will make our land productive again. And so Lord, we pray that you would forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us that we would forgive others 
the way that you have forgiven us and that we would love one another the way we should and the way you have loved us, Lord. And so, Lord, today we also pray for those in need, those who are suffering, those who have experienced loss, those who are going through a period of grief. We pray that you, the God of all comfort, would make your presence and your love and your provision real to them today. We pray for those in need. And now, Heavenly Father, the God of heaven, we thank you for this beautiful land called Canada, a land of provision and blessing. And we pray, God, that you would keep our Canada glorious and free. We pray it in your lovely and holy name. Amen. This is no ordinary church and this is no ordinary scandal. Worldwide investigation into the evil and destructive ways of a self-proclaimed Messiah. Last year after Zacharias' death, more sexual abuse victims came forward with allegations. Well, Canadians continue to mourn after the discovery of the remains of 215 children at a former residential but school. But it all came crashing down last fall when Les was fired and admitted to an affair. Fences still up around the Edmonton area church that's been long defying Alberta public health orders. He's now facing some very disturbing allegations made by one of his own archbishops. And sadly, for, for many who are hearing the news, it's not surprising. I don't know if you're like me, but maybe when you watch that sermon starter, you had a large range of emotions. <laughs> maybe your first emotion was anger. You're angry at church leaders who are corrupt and broken. Maybe it was a bit of shame or you were ashamed because these men and women are supposed to represent us and they haven't done that very well. Or maybe in the church in general, you're just disappointed that the church isn't what you know and what I know it could be. And maybe you watched that and you thought to yourself, you know what, we should be better. We can do better. And you're right. And that's what this series is all about, entitled Let's Be Better. It's about this reality of the church, the church that I love and I serve and I want to be a part of, was designed by Jesus to be beautiful and powerful, to bring positive change in our community. And when it works, man, it is a beautiful thing. It is attractive. It is, it is something that people want to be a part of. But when it's not, I know, just like that sermon starter, it is filled with frustration and anger and fear and shame. So how do we get this right? Well, that's what this series is really all about. And it's gonna be taken out of the book of 1 Timothy. So Paul is the author of this book. Um, and he is one of the most prolific writers in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, he writes two thirds of the New Testament. And he is writing to his protege, uh, a man he has mentored, Timothy, who is gonna pastor this church. And he's gonna to write to Timothy. And in this book, he's gonna outline four things, four key things that will destroy the beauty of what the church could be and should be. It's Paul's way of saying, you know what? We have got to do better. And he's right. And so in week number one, this week, we're going to talk about bad theology. Bad theology destroys the church. And then we're going to talk about corrupt leaders in week number two. And then we're going to talk about apathy. And then finally, hypocrisy. These four things that if we're not careful and we don't guard our own hearts against, it will destroy us and destroy the beauty of what the church is supposed to be. And what we're going to learn is that it's not enough just to respond. Now, that's what the media does, right? It points a finger, hurls a stone. It just responds. And, and I know this from my own personal experience. We, we just change churches. We just, we just write people off. We, we dismiss and cut people out of our life. And that isn't, that isn't sufficient. We've got to also take responsibility. How can we do this together better? And that's what I want for you. And that's what I want for me. And that's what I want for Central. So if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. And I want you to keep it open there uh, in verses 3 and 5, because we're going to sit in, this, in these two verses for the entire time together. Or if you have your mobile device, download it on the YouVersion uh, app, and you can get that as well. So here's what Paul says to his protege, Timothy, on how the church he thinks can be better. He says in verse 3, Command certain people not to teach false doctrines, 
any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from what? A pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. So Paul starts by saying, we all, all of us need to have good doctrine, sound doctrine. Now, I know when you think of that word doctrine, you might be thinking of a list on a wall somewhere. You might be thinking about a bunch of commandments, a bunch of do's and don'ts. But doctrine simply means what you choose to believe, you choose to believe as it informs your actions, how what you believe is applied in your life. And what Paul is saying is that the church has got to have really good, sound doctrine. Because from the beginning of time, we as human beings, we've identified ourselves by groups. And the truth is, who you hang out with, you become like. And so he's saying this sound doctrine isn't just about you or me. It's about all of us together working toward a better goal, being better. And the interesting thing about this is it doesn't mean we're always going to agree. And it doesn't mean that all of our ideas are going to line up. It just means we are going to choose the beautiful things that God has taught in his word that changes the world for better. And so he says, be careful of myths and endless genealogies. Now, I was fascinated with that. So I, I took a bit of time to unpack that. Like, what were these myths and en endless genealogies? And I'm sorry to disappoint you. I really couldn't find it out. But here's, here's a couple of things I did dig up. These myths, obviously, were things that have been added to on top of uh, in spite of the truth that was already revealed. They were added ideas or thoughts. And the second thing, these endless genealogies were basically people were looking at their family heritage and going, well, I'm better than you because look at my family heritage. It was this idea of separation. It was, it was this thought that we can use our ideas to make ourselves feel elite, feel better than everyone else or separate. And that is what he's trying to destroy. He's trying to destroy this elitist attitude that somehow, oh, I've got insider information, right? And, and come on, that's what a lot of us focus on. Oh, I've got, I've got something, some secret in here that no one else knows. And come on, really? Like, it's like these guys who ta start talking about, you know, for 2,000 years or whatever, 6,000 years, people didn't know this, but now we know it in 2021, so we're better. Come on, like, that's just ridiculous, and we, we had all these speculation around this stuff. Or, or we think we're better because we belong to a certain denomination or we have some certain angle on the good news that we find in here. And he's saying, stop it. Stop it. These things, he says, only promote controversial speculation. <laughs> uh, come on, Let, let's be honest. I mean, how many controversial conversations have you been in that was pure speculation? Whether it was about a certain part of the Bible, something that's going on in government, and it didn't really help. Did it make your family dynamic better? Did it make you go, I wanna hang out with you more? No, he's saying these things don't help and they don't advance God's work. What is God's work? To reach all people with his amazing love. It's that simple. So if this is, if anything you believe or you hold any doctrine or ideology that separates you from people, makes you feel like you're better than people, that people are worse than you, he's saying, no, no, you've missed it. And he reinforces this by saying, the goal of this command is love. <laughs> so to start right at the very beginning, he's saying, be very careful what you choose to believe because what you believe impacts how you live. And as followers of Jesus, as the church, we are to believe that God is love, that God so loved the whole world that he gave his only son, that whoever, whoever believes in him will be saved. It is a message of hope and reconciliation, not condemnation, not speculation. It is a message of hope and peace. Our message, our doctrine, our life, should be better and should make the world around us better. I think that's what he's getting at. And so I think he's trying to teach us that the goal of biblical teaching is love. Like, how do you know if it's good? Well, it's loving. And it's in line with God's truth, what God has revealed about himself and this world. Okay, so why do we struggle with this? I mean, it seems pretty straightforward, right? You're probably going... Yeah, why are you making a big deal about this? <laughs> well, because I've been around a little bit and I know that I've had to walk through a lot of myths and endless genealogies in my own life. Things I used to think were important and really value and fight people, literally fight people over. 
that didn't matter. And so I think in order to get to this place, we need to avoid three things. The first is confirmation bias. And what I mean by that is you and I were all raised in a certain context. And if you grew up in a religious context, you, you probably believed, and, and that was okay, that your way was the only way, or that your group, you know, your, your, the way your group thought and acted was the best way, the, the, and everyone else had to be like you. And he's saying, actually, no, that's, that's not it. Um, I think another one is that you have to avoid fear. None of us likes to be told what to do, so we don't like to be challenged. So whenever we come up with a new idea, we kind of reject it. And he's saying, no, you got to avoid that. And the final one we need to avoid is pain. Um, the truth is that we've all been hurt in some way, shape, or form by a bad idea, bad theology. Um, maybe you grew up um, in a church context and you, you kind of grew out of some of the things that you thought. And you thought, man, why did I ever believe that or think that? And so you're tempted to just reject it all. So what he's saying is, don't throw it all out. Let's do better. Let's reclaim really good doctrine. And the goal of this command is love. And he gives actually three indicators. So this is going to be great. It's very practical. Three ways you can know if your doctrine, your belief that's informing your action is solid. He says it comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. So let's talk about these three really quickly. The first is what's a pure heart? Well, Pure, literally in the Greek, means to be innocent in your motivation. And again, who is the purest person you know, uh, purest of heart? Well, Jesus. Okay, <laughs> now that we've got that established, um, what was Jesus like? Jesus just loved people. Jesus really loved people. And, and so I think teaching that is pure of heart means teaching that really wants people to win. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes I hear teaching and it's just angry He's just angry. He just hates people. It's like, you're all bad. You're awful. And I hate you all. Or, or, or sometimes teaching is like, I'm, I'm elite. I'm better than anyone else. And I don't think that's the point. It's, it's, is your teaching, is your doctrine, what you believe really rooted in love? And I need you to know something about, we take this really seriously here at Central. We take this so seriously that I'm accountable on many levels for this. I'm accountable to a board that you elect and that board for all intents and purposes, are my directors. If I step out of line, or if I do something that's harmful, or I do something that they think is hurting people, I am accountable to them. And then if you think, well, the board could be corrupt, okay, well then even abo above that, we belong to a fellowship of other churches that we've agreed to work together so that we can make sure that love always wins. Everything you hear me say, everything we believe as a church must be rooted in God's amazing love. So he's saying, whenever you hear teaching that, yeah, it doesn't really feel like it loves people. Like, doesn't make you feel like you're loved or valued. Be really, be really cautious about that. The second thing is, it's teaching that comes from a good conscience. Um, this is going to be a little difficult, okay? Because I, 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 I have to work through this myself. But that word, good conscience, literally in the Greek means a the moral high ground. What I think is, not only does good doctrine love people, but good doctrine is is honest, is honest. I think we need to do better in this area. And what I mean by that is that we all need to be open to our ideas being challenged. Look, the truth is that you're not going to find a leader who's perfect. You're not going to find a leader who agrees with you in every point. You're going to even find leaders who are going to teach things that are maybe a little different than what you believe. And the point is, yes, you can respond to that and just leave and bail. That doesn't solve it. Or you can dig in and take responsibility and work together to find good doctrine. And it has to be honest. It has to be able to ask the really tough questions without fear of retribution. It must be able to explore new thoughts and ideas on who God is and how he works with us. It must be authentic. That's what this means. In a good conscience, you must be able to lay your head down on the bed at pillow at night and say, no, I really, really, really believe this. I don't believe this just because I was told I had to believe it. I don't believe it because it's all I've ever known. I really believe it. It's authentic. And I need, I'm, I'm going to make, I make a promise to you. I make a promise to you right now. I have never said anything to you that I don't actually believe and actually want to live out. And I'll never ask you to do something that I'm not willing to do myself. So in that good doctrine idea, it's a message that promotes love and it's a doctrine that is honest. And then finally, he says, sincere in faith. And, and literally, it's just a faith that works. Like we talked about all last uh, month in our sermon series, sincere, not hypocritical. I think the final thing is, well, yeah, good doctrine loves people. Good doctrine is honest, but I think good doctrine is also really practical. Like it works. I think the endless speculation piece is 
come on, there's a lot of things that we talk about that really don't matter. Like, who cares? Like, like really, is it gonna make my life better? Is it gonna make your neighbor's life better? Is it gonna make the life of your kids better? The person you go to school with better? The person you work with better? If, if it's not, I mean, yeah, talk about it all you want. It's okay, write books about it, that's fine. But don't make it a core doctrine. Good doctrine is practical. And so I think the application here is, does what I believe really bring positive change? Does it bring positive change? And so I, I took these three thoughts and I said, what kind of a church do we want to be? What kind of a church do you want to belong to? And I want to belong to a church where people are committed to good doctrine, a doctrine that loves people, a doctrine that is honest, willing to explore without fear of retribution, a, a, a doctrine that is, that is honest and authentic and practical. It actually works. It makes the world better. So I dream and I hope that we will be a place where you can be safe to grow, to ask questions and to explore your faith and to find what you believe for yourself as it applies to your living every day. And so I think that teaching that is faithful to Jesus honestly results in genuine love and in genuine faith. And so for the next four weeks, because we believe this, we wanna do something together. And, and I hope you participate, even though you're watching online or watching at home with your family, I want us to read this reminder. It's a public declaration. It's an affirmation of what we as a church family, as the church body, believe together that we can be better. And today we commit ourselves to good doctrine, a doctrine that loves people, is honest, and is practical. It makes a difference. And so let's do this together now. It is our desire to follow Jesus in His way, His truth, and His life. Today we surrender ourselves to His purpose for our lives, our church, and our community. We commit ourselves to the truth found in the Word of God. We commit ourselves to godly leadership as we learn to lead ourselves and others well. We commit ourselves to taking responsibility to the great commandment by deeply caring for one another. We commit ourselves to the great commission by doing all we can to represent and reveal Jesus in our community. In all these ways, we declare our faith in God, hope in Jesus, and trust in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So thank you for making that declaration with us today. And maybe you're watching and you realize, I, I need to be a part of this. And maybe you don't have a faith yet. Maybe, maybe you've never actually said yes to Jesus in your life. Maybe you've never committed to solid doctrine. Um, and it's because you've had a misunderstanding of what the church is. Maybe you've been hurt by the church or you've rejected the church. And today you realize, man, if that's what the church is, I want in. I want to follow Jesus. We want to invite you to do that. I'm going to say a prayer at the end. I want you to pray with me. But maybe you're here also and you feel like, I don't, I don't have that space. I don't have that space to explore my faith and where I feel loved and valued and protected, where I can be honest and, and I can really figure out practical ways to make my life and the lives around me better. We want to invite you into that. And it's called Groups here at Central. We want you to be a part of this. And we know that most meaningful ministry happens in groups. And so that's the place that you can explore this doctrine. And if, if that place isn't safe for you, then I want you to talk to us. And that's the third thing. Maybe, maybe you're here and you're like, I don't know if this is a safe space for me. I want you to talk to us. I want you to talk to us leaders so we can help figure out how to do that for you. But what's really fascinating about this, if you read further in 1 Timothy, is Paul says, when you have these kinds of conversations, because you're gonna have the hard ones, approach if someone's older than you, like you would a father or a mother, or if they're the same age, like a brother or a sister. Treat each other with love and respect. We could do a lot better in this as well. It doesn't mean we're always gonna agree, we're not. It doesn't mean we're always gonna see everything the same way, it doesn't. It just means that together, we're gonna work on loving you we're gonna work really hard on creating spaces you can be honest and transparent and explore faith safely. And we wanna to work together to make sure that this really makes the world around us better. That's the kind of doctrine we wanna commit ourselves to. So 
I wanna pray with you and for you. You can join me, you can pray in your own way, however you want, but I wanna do this with you right now. And so, Father, for those who maybe are just wondering, do I, do I need something more in my life? And today they realize they need some good doctrine. They need, they need a faith. They need something to believe in and to live for. And today something is stirred inside of them. Maybe they had it a long time ago and they've lost it, or maybe they've never had it and someone invited them into this experience right now. I pray that they would just simply believe that you love them and that you came into this world so they could accept and follow you. Jesus, we follow you because we know that you are the best way to live this life. And so I acknowledge my need for you. And for those right now who need to make that declaration for themselves, I pray that they'd find freedom and forgiveness and that they'd find safety and they'd follow you today. For those who maybe feel like they don't have any space, I pray that we would be the kind of church or wherever they're living, wherever they're watching this, there would be churches that would embrace them, they could be connected to, they could grow and they could explore in their faith. And then finally, for those who maybe feel like they've been disconnected, would you give them the grace and the wisdom to navigate to talk to us leaders, to, to help us figure this out together. This is all of us, we all want this. So my prayer, God, is simple. We want a doctrine that works. We want to believe in things that matter, that make the world a better place. So help us to pursue doctrine that loves people, that is honest, and that is practical, because I believe that honors you. So I pray this in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus, amen. Thanks so much for tuning in today. And I want to invite you to take a moment to reflect through some of the discussion questions in just a moment on what God is speaking to you. We'd also love to challenge you to take your next step today with God and others. There are a few ways you can do that here at Central. First, if you've made a decision today to follow Jesus, we'd love to celebrate with you as we can't think of a better decision you could have ever made. We'd love to help you on that journey if we can. So if you made that decision, Simply text the word CENTRAL to 905-937-5610 and we'll follow up with you this week. Also, if you're watching during our broadcast times of 9 or 10.30, we'd love for you to stick around after this experience for a group called Virtual Coffee Connections. You can jump into our Zoom discussion for about 45 minutes where we engage with the message and spend some time praying together and growing in our spiritual journeys. Lastly, today, don't forget to sign up for baptisms if you would like to take your next step in following Jesus. Again, details are at centralcc.ca slash baptism. If you have any questions on how to get connected, simply head over to centralcc.ca slash connect or text the word central to 905-937-5610 and you'll find everything you need there on how to get connected. Well, that's all from me. We hope you have an amazing week and we'll see you right back here next week.